All right, well, let's get started. This is number nine of our really yeah. Right? Number nine. <laughs> we have so much to talk about. <laughs> That's a lot. Right? Okay, so here's our disclaimer. Uh, we are not doctors, nurses, or medical professionals. The information including, but not limited to, text, graphics, images, and other materials are for informational purposes only. The purpose of information, informational material is to promote broad consumer understanding and knowledge of cannabis. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional legal or medical advice, medical diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding medical conditions or treatments before undertaking a new healthcare regimen. And never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it. And today we have Cody and myself, Pam. Angela is out today. Um, I believe she's throwing a wedding today. <laughs> and outside, like impromptu. So um, she's not with us today. <laughs> uh, and we're going, this is what we're going to go over. And mostly Angela, she helps us out with more of the medical side as she consults with doctors and patients. And um, we're going to like that with her. So today we're actually just going to go over um, our personal reg regulations, like what applies to us personally for cannabis um, legalization, both on state and Long Beach level. So we'll just go through it. And some of this stuff that I, I, I have used in presentations at Cal State Long Beach and with the health department and um, it's an interesting information to that's surrounding our laws that surround, I mean, that have to do with our own personal consumption. Yeah. Our and, rights. Right? Our rights, exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's different from state and local level. And, you know, since we're, we're kind of on the industry side, we're, we're always thinking of like regulations having to do with business right? Not really us when we're talking, when we're just like working in the industry, we're always thinking about that. But it also has to do with our personal consumption too at your local, at your local level, level. So like state, the state regulations kind of put like a general blanket of laws and then the local government can ban any like commercial activity, but they cannot infringe on your rights to consume. We'll go over those in detail. I always think about, I always think about, um, you know, Peter Tosh, legalize it. I'm always thinking about, man, if we only knew what we were singing back then, we would have <laughs> made a lot more noise. <laughs> right. Yeah, because we have so much cleanup to do, <laughs> legislatively, right? Oh my God. And like, sure, Peter Tosh, we legalize it and you can advertise it, but we have rules against that too. <laughs> yeah. So, cannabis right now still remains um, classified as Schedule 1 under the federal guidelines, our Federal Controlled Substance Act that was put into place in 1970. So, we still go over that list, and it still says that cannabis is alongside of heroin and has no medical use and highly addictive. So, it's still labeled that way, although there are more than 30 states, I think we're at 30 three now that have legalized either medicinally or um, for adult use or both. So, and there's only three states, I believe, that have full um, still prohibition. And um, yeah, there's only three out of full 50. So it's only time that, you know, things will change on a federal level and we'll see where that goes. You know, we do have advocates on the federal side. Um, there's always like news coming in for those kind of movements. Uh, it's a really easy Google search to look at some of those articles. This is a follow you know, we always talk about. <laughs> we only need a couple more states. We only need a couple more states, and it's the whole thing is decriminalized. Mm -hmm. And like 50 states, and you're, you know, that's majority. It's already at majority, right? Yeah, it's definitely already majority. 30 at majority. Um, so yeah, take a look at this little cartoon. And this is, you know, what needs to change in our you know, medical 
um, areas so our patients can have better access to um, cannabis. In cannabis education, so if our doctors are educated, then they can educate our patients too. So that, that's an area that needs to be changed. And it's just icon, you know, an icon, but ironic that regular doctors, they can't because of the uh, medical association, they cannot write a prescription for uh, medical cannabis, but they can give you opium or opioids, which are highly, highly. Exactly. All right. So how old do you have to be to legally use cannabis in California? So medicinal use, you have to be 18 with the recommendation. And there's a little caveat to this is because people can be, you can be a minor and still receive uh, medicinal use. You just have to have a caregiver that also has, um, that says it's your caregiver and they have a recommendation too. And then they have to be 18 and older. So that's what the 18 and older is. So really there are patients that are under 18 that come in with their caregivers who are adults older than 18 to um, pick up purchase their medication. I haven't seen that in our shop yet, actually. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, it's been hard. And like a lot of people right now, there's been, you know, a lot of people still use their growers, like from 215. So, yeah, 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 yeah. So they have their caregivers, yeah. Yes, only because that what we have available on the, on the legal market right now isn't the same. Right. Like there was patient, there were like younger patients who would get something specific. Um, and sometimes like their, you know, their adults just come in and buy it now because if they're just like, like forget the recommendation. Right. I'm sure, yeah. I know exactly what you need. But a lot of them like had like a specific ratio, right? Like, so maybe their grower would, you know, could process it for them too and give them a tincture that was like, I don't know, 18 to four or something. Mm -hmm. And that worked for them. And so when they didn't have that anymore, they don't have that anymore. So they have to go to, you know, other resources. And it could be too that parents or their caregivers just bypass their recommendation. If they already know what works, they can just come in and buy what they know that works. And then they don't have right. to. That's true too. Yeah. It's interesting how that shift happened, right? And how we're, yeah. I'm not even sure if there's like patients coming in anymore. And if they're getting, um, if they're getting full access. So then adult use is 21 and up and you just need a valid ID from pretty much any government around the world. <laughs> Could be a passport or um, another country's identification. Um, valid. All right, so where can you legally purchase cannabis? You can only purchase cannabis legally at a dispensary. And at a legal licensed dispensary, because there's a lot of unlicensed dispensaries. And that's kind of a big issue right now. There's people that are new to cannabis and um, they can't tell the difference, right? Between a regular shop and maybe an illicit shop. I mean, we know because we're in the industry and we, we know what to look for. But without that information, um, yeah, it's kind of hard to tell. Especially if you haven't been around cannabis either and you're not sure what it looks like or how you're supposed to purchase it. Yeah, you have no idea. If you have no idea, then you might walk into an illicit market in our store and just think that's normal. And maybe it's not. And you're not sure if that stuff is tested either. But in California, they do have, um, now all licensed dispensaries have a QR code and it's usually somewhere in the lobby or somewhere in public view that people could check on that store. And here in Long Beach, we have a similar system called the Emblem Program, I think, in dispensaries and legal um, cannabis operations have that outside their building. I think we have it in our window on the front. I think. But I know the QR codes um, by the door. <laughs> All right. So this is a huge thing, huge barrier for cannabis consumers as well, especially for patients. 
So where can cannabis be um, legally used? Like, so where can you consume legally? That's not, you know, civil disobedience somewhere in a parking lot. <laughs> right. Um, so definitely not at the dispensary. You can't do that. Especially not Long Beach. Um, not at a pharmacy. Not at the beach or a park. Not at a government building, of course, <laughs> or outside. Um, this is a huge one. So this represents, this building right here represents um, apartments or, you know, uh, condos or anything like that, that type of building. And so if that building is a smoke-free building, it could be a good chance that um, cannabis consumers are not allowed to consume their cannabis here, which is unfortunate. But um, there are laws that, um, that are coming up, that's always coming up in policy and people talking about how to fix that. That's really about access too, because then you can purchase your cannabis here, but then you have nowhere to actually consume it, because where are you going to consume it? Unless it's just edibles or tinctures, and those are usually, you know, undetectable, I guess you could say, are not as imposing to your neighbors as smoke. I was thinking about, you know, the air cleaners, right? Like get an air scrubber, a little yeah. one in your apartment. Oh, I have one. I have a, I definitely have one too. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. if it gets too thick, like, you know, especially like blunts and stuff like that, you know, keeps my neighbors from uh, having to smell it if they don't like it, you know, exactly. uh, courteous. You're a good neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, like I just said, like no smoking, of course, but um, edibles are okay. Um, definitely not at schools or colleges, any campuses, and um, only at your house. So, if you, so this is a huge, um, you know, very so nowhere, like nowhere. Only people <laughs> at home. And this is really interesting. So, this story that I'm gonna tell you right now is about. So Cal, Cal State Long Beach last year, last year they had, they had a low pro like cannabis day or week or something. It was very like, they didn't really talk about it, but they wanted to do some kind of like education. So the LBCA had a booth there and our, out, the outreach person was there all like for, I don't know, four hours. It was like, you know, a thing you come and talk to people at their booth. And um, he said that somebody approached him and was very, um, anti-cannabis and was like I don't think anybody should be consuming cannabis you know blah 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 and he was like really he was like well and he's um he's an amputee so he uses it a lot for pain he uses cannabis all day long for pain and he, and he was telling her about that and he was like and if I lived in an apartment you know own my own home then I couldn't you know be able to help myself out with pain and she her comeback was pretty much that if you don't own your own home, then you shouldn't be able to consume cannabis in an apartment. <laughs> and just, he well, told me, right? I was like, oh, wow, we need to do so much more education. <laughs> <laughs> We're not there yet. We're not there yet. And that was from, you know, a college student that was, you know, I don't know what year she was in, but she was a college student. <laughs> Man. Like, wow, we got some work to do. <laughs> Like that's, you know, that's a barrier. So really right now, if you own your own home, that's the place that you can consume. If you live in an apartment or in a rental even, that's the house that you're renting, um, yeah, you may not be able to. That's a huge barrier that is on the books. Yeah. This is all mostly almost like things that, things that we need to fix in, <laughs> in our cannabis regulation. Horrible. So, if you're consuming in your car, it's definitely an automatic DUI, even if it's parked and your keys are out of the ignition. They consider that yeah. in container, basically, in, like, consuming in Remember we used to have the lounges and all that stuff in L.A.? And yeah. We're trying yeah. to get I mean, hatch bars. Here for anything social. But, um, yeah, I mean, I definitely see that in our future lounges. Yeah. We have to, because where else are we going to? If you can't consume in any of these places legally, like that just sets people up for tickets and fines. I used to love the hash bars in Venice Beach. Those were awesome. Right. 
All right. Um, so these are some other regulations. Um, this is very interesting, right? I always think about this. You probably think about this when you're, um, you know, helping people out. So I always think it's interesting that adult use and medicinal use, like dry cannabis is different. You can possess eight ounces if you have your recommendation or you can, or it's one ounce if you're adult use. But the amount of um, concentrated grams is eight for both. And I'm always confused on that because how does that help a medicinal consumer or a patient if they are only allowed to buy eight grams at a time and they need more? Mm -hmm. It's just limiting. I think it should be more for medicinal patients. For yeah, and people want to stock up, you know, especially at a time like this, you know, pandemic and all that. I mean, people right, are coming in and going. Or like, who knows where people at are in their in their illness? You know, yeah. a lot of people that are in like palliative care or at the end, they need a lot of cannabis to relieve their um, symptoms. Exactly. Uh, um, cultivation is. <clears throat> different and is kind of awesome still it's still the gray area um if you're a medicinal patient it's kind of like how much you need to grow there's not really a, a thing like um they did try to slide that into 64 to make it only you can only have six plants per it's actually per household per place um but this still for for medicinal use this is still gray. Like they say, no, it's still six plants, but if it's medicinal and you need more than that, well then you're gonna need more. Yeah. Yeah, and some places are just six plants per household period. So. Per household period, and then that's where like your local laws come in, right? Yeah. Like in Long Beach here, you ha if you're growing um, outside, I think that they could, I think local laws can ban outside grows, but they cannot mm -hmm. grow inside, anywhere. Yep. I was living in Sac in Sacramento, and they they weren't allowing outside grow. So exactly. So Long Beach, you can do outside grow. It just has to be behind like a locked gate. So like if you have a backyard and you have like grown in okay. the and you have a gate, you just have to have your gate locked, and it can't be seen from like the sidewalk. That's good to hear. Yeah. Um, and then you know employment and drug tests. I mean, that's still a thing. We still haven't had, we, I haven't seen a bill come through um, the state process about that. I'm hoping somebody's going to headline that pretty soon and have that. I want to say that there's a state in, on the East Coast that passed that law. That since, you know, cannabis is legal now for adult use, that employers can no longer, you know, fire somebody for THC. Unless there was like an incident. You know, like yeah. if somebody's like a forklift or something and they crash it or something like that, <laughs> it's usually automatic, right? You're going to have to go get a drug test. Are you yeah. drunk right now? Or <laughs> yeah. But um, hopefully somebody will bring that up in California. I'm seeing, you know, seeing any of our legislators um, will do that. And I always say, if you guys have a really good, I have an idea if you guys are always looking at these regulations, you're like, man, this needs a change. Call your legislation, you know, call whoever you're, wherever you live, who your senator is or your assembly person and leave them a message. They have to respond to every email and every phone call at some point, like they have to respond. So <laughs> if you keep bringing that to them and sound like a broken record, sometimes we can make change that way. So these next slides are actually about um, DUI. And these are like, so you can have a perspective of what we have you know, the California DUI perspective of cannabis. Or actually public health. I can't even say like, I don't know what the enforcement perspective is, but this is the perspective of public health. Um, so yes, we don't, we don't want to be driving while we're stoned. You're not supposed to use cannabis in a parked vehicle. Your passenger can't use it while you're driving and you cannot have an open. So they really consider your, um, cannabis however you have it like an open container so if you have like your vape sitting like next to you or you're driving like that could be considered as an open container just so you know when you get pulled if you get pulled over these are the things they look for yeah definitely don't have a roach in your ashtray don't do it 
just don't do it. Don't have, like, That's an the easiest way to get caught this moment. Open gummies, like, your council. Just don't do it. And I would say, don't ever keep vapes in your car, period. Like, just don't do it. That's just, you know, there's or, they're already, like, made of metal, so the metal will leach out. So just try not to keep them in your car where it gets hot. That too, yeah. I don't want to do that. Okay, so here's some comparisons of a DUI with alcohol and DUI with cannabis. And this was um, from a study, I forgot what year this was, but it was pretty recent, like in the last, like I would say five years. It's really interesting. So when you're sober, you have minimal movement within the lane, right? So this is in between the white lines. So when you're drunk, you usually like go, you like pull to the left a lot more. So like people that are drunk driving, they pull to the left more. If you're high um, on THC, you kind of just like go in the lane. You're not like moving outside the lane, but you're just like, you stay, people stay in the lane. They just kind of go a little bit back and forth. So average speed, people that are drunk driving usually have increased speed. People that are on THC usually have decreased speed. You usually drive super slow. So true. Oh my god. I was like, oh my god, I'm going 60. I'm going 55. And you pulled over for that too. They're like, uh, hello? Yeah. You do. Like, oh my bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, risk taking. So we know that alcohol really induces, you know, some risk taking. I've been on, on that side, taking stupid risks. Let's jump off in this roof into a pool or something. You don't really see people that are on THC doing things like that. No. <laughs> uh, maybe on some really good sativa, but I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Even then, I don't think so. <laughs> so Not much yeah. about it. You take fewer risks, people that um, are under THC intoxication. Okay, so this is following distance. So, you know, people that tailgate. Of course, people that are drunk driving, they have a smaller following distance. They are like on people's bumpers, usually. That's always scary. And again, with cannabis, people that are have DUIs on cannabis, they're usually like really far back. Driving super slow, really far back. <laughs> Stopping at yellow lights. They're like, no, I'm just going to stop at the yellow. They're not even going to take the chance. I got to pack another bowl. Hold on. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, so reaction time. Reaction time is actually the same. So this is where it's in the same area. Slower reaction time. Of course, when you're drunk, you have slower reaction time. And when you're stoned, you pretty much have slower reaction time. And collision. So collision, when you're um, under the influence of alcohol, is seven to nine times as likely um, and compared to cannabis is two times as likely. And that just has to be because, you know, there's less risk involved here. I mean, there is still some, but there's less risk. So it's two times as likely than sober. So, you know, all those headlines that you hear when people are like, there was this crazy accident, usually. And it's usually like the people that are just very misinformed and they always throw cannabis in it. And it's usually like, this person was high on marijuana and then like and alcohol and I'm just thinking to myself so you don't really think it was the alcohol you think it was all the cannabis that was that made this thing happen <laughs> for this oh yeah the cross side the cross side sure. right it's interesting the you know the headlines so and these are the factors from DUI so like I always I always take this I mean because I come from public health I'm always looking at all of these and people get <laughs> for DUIs Look at all of it. You know, you can't, like I just said, like, you know, the headlines will say to try to demonize cannabis still that, oh, this, you know, this person was under an influence of cannabis, but what else were they under the influence of? Was it alcohol? Did they have over-the-counter medications like a ton of NyQuil? I don't know, or whatever, <laughs> or sold over-the-counter. Did they have other illicit, did they have illicit drugs in their system as well? And, or did they take a bunch of prescription medications? So, you know, those all react differently together. And I think sometimes the stigma around cannabis, it always highlights it, I always think. So when you're looking at those headlines that say somebody was had a DUI with cannabis, look further into it. I usually, usually there's something else underlying. Hmm. Okay, 
So check out this short PSA. So this PSA was supposed to air in 2016 when, or actually early 2000, oh look, I totally had a typo, this is 2106. <laughs> um, this was supposed to air in like early 2017, so right after Prop 64 was passed. So check it out. Wheat. Pot. Edibles. Trees. Dabs. Loud. It helps my anxiety. My cramps. My appetite. It allows me to uh, slow my thought process. It helps me feel balanced. It gets me going. It helps me feel normal. More social. I just like it. It's fun. It smells good. Okay, I love it. But I don't drive. I don't drive. I don't drive. I never drive home. No matter why. It's still a DUI. DUI doesn't just mean booze. All right, so that was the transport authority that put that together. And they never aired it. They pulled it because it said, you know why? It's because they said that it was too um, supportive of cannabis benefits. Too supportive of cannabis, huh? Yeah, like it wasn't, um, you know, neutral enough. It was too biased on the benefits of cannabis. That's why they pulled it. But I thought it was really good. I was like, that's, that's good. Like it was very, a variety of why people use cannabis. Yeah, it wasn't too much about cannabis. I mean, it was about everything, how people use it. They use it for so many different reasons. Yeah. All right, so this next slide is really just a, a thing I stuck in here just to give you some statistics, um, crashes. So really, people that text are the, are the ones that are getting in crashes more than alcohol and more than... Um, um, of course, more than, than cannabis, because that just really doesn't, I mean, two times isn't that big of a risk. So this, you were 23 times as likely to crash if you're texting. 23 times. So just in comparison of our slide with the alcohol and cannabis. It's a problem. And this is most, the most of the people uh, range that die from these kind of car crashes. So it's all, it's all of us, basically. <laughs> it's pretty much yeah, five. Literally. It's, <laughs> it's waiting to happen. <laughs> so don't text and drive either. <laughs> it's way worse than it's it's way worse than all, all everything. Okay, so this is just a good snapshot of what people said they use um, cannabis for, and I think this was from 2018. Um, mostly people use it for stress, right? Everybody, even people that don't think they use it medicinally, but just think they use it for adult use, they're always like. You know, I don't know. They just use it to feel. They're always like, "Well, why do you use cannabis?" And even then, they're like, "I don't know. I just feel better." Mostly because you're probably like relieving some, you know, one of these two. Like, exactly. Right. <laughs> That's like the biggest relief because it makes me feel better. Okay, so I don't feel stressed out. <laughs> right. All right. So this is a kind of fun little, um, little snapshot too about comparing. Um, the therapeutic index. Of and I think I've talked about this before. Does this sound familiar, Cody? Did I talk about this before in another workshop? I might have. So there is a legal, uh, lethal dose and effective. Yeah. Does that sound familiar, maybe? Mm -hmm. um, so scientists figure out the, like the, how lethal any substance is by this formula. I guess you could say, the therapeutic index. So they look at how much of any kind of substance will kill 50% of the population and how much of it is effective dose on half the population, meaning the average dose, you know, whatever average is going to be. So we're going to look at a couple different ones. So injectable heroin. <laughs> effective dose usually is, let's just say it's one, one injection. And um, five would be the lethal dose. So it only takes five times. That's why there's so many. Like that is why there's highly um, uh, overdoses with heroin is because the therapeutic index is small. It's only five. It only takes five times the amount to kill you. So acetaminophen, known as Tylenol. So Tylenol is our, you know, fever reducer, pain reliever. Two is the effective dose, right? You take two, 
that you usually should do the trick for you. Um, but <clears throat> its effective dose, I believe, is 100. So if you took 200 Tylenol, that would most likely kill you. So that is acetaminophen um, therapy. Now for alcohol, alcohol is different. So alcohol is, say three shots, you take three shots all at one time, you'd probably be pretty buzzed. I would be pretty drunk, actually, if I took that all at one time, I'd be pretty smashed. Um, but alcohol can actually kill you directly. So if you took um, 30 shots all at one time, like a huge, I don't know, put 30 shots at one glass and you drink the whole thing, your liver might just explode and you just might die. So alcohol is a 10. So it's 10 times your effective dose that will kill you. So and this is a reason why um, cannabis doesn't kill us. It mostly has to do with our endocannabinoid system and the phytocannabinoids working with our receptors and our endocannabinoids. So say your dose of cannabis I don't know, we're just going to say, we're just going to call it one dose, like whatever your one dose of cannabis is. I don't know, maybe it's 50 for you, maybe it's 30 for me, whatever that is. Uh, so we would have to take, didn't even know how much you'd have to take because nobody's ever died directly from cannabis. But they say it's upward towards 20,000 to 40,000 times your effective dose. You can't even take that much. Like you couldn't, you just couldn't take that much. You just can't. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you've seen those videos. I'm sure we've all seen those videos of people dabbing like the gigantic, the most huge dabs. And you're like, oh my God, this person's just going to like. Yeah. No, literally. Like, like, just like. Gallons of syrup. <laughs> yes. Right? And they usually just pass out and then. It'd be too high to finish it. Yes, exactly. And they get too, they get too stuck. All right, so our last couple slides are just about how much you can grow. So this directly, this information comes directly from our Long Beach, um, Long Beach cannabis page, or I think, no, they're, they're, they call it cannabis now. For a long time, they had like a marijuana page, and I was like, you guys, you change your word. So they change your word. Um, so this is basically, if you're doing adult use, like you're just like, I'm going to try to grow some cannabis. This is what you have to be 21 and older. You can process up to six plants at one time per residence. They must be kept in a locked space. It can't be visible from the public right away. So like on a, can't be seen from like the sidewalk. And it can be in, grown indoors or outdoors here in Long Beach. And it can be um, only grown on the grounds at your private residence. So I'm thinking like, you know, you can't go and get like a, community plot to grow vegetables. <laughs> and probably would be here anyways, like I'm just probably bad. Um, potatoes. <laughs> right. So these um you can actually go to this website. This is our Long Beach City website to look at this yourself and see what the regulations are of growing your own um your own cannabis. I would say if you have room for it, I would I always, you know, encourage people to try it. It gives you a lot of appreciation for what, you know, when you come and you know, visit the dispensaries and buy product, it gives you appreciation for it because it's really hard. <laughs> yeah, especially if you don't have any indoors extra space or you don't want to use electricity. I mean, if you have a good side yard or backyard or anything, uh, you always can do the outdoor season, which is from April to May to about October. Mm -hmm. So you guys know. And really, I mean, I've heard, I mean, we live in such a great area. It's like, I've heard people grow year round. Here yeah, if you have a greenhouse and you can, you can black it out, you know, yeah, you can, definitely. I've totally seen people grow year round here. The mm -hmm. bugs, man, the bugs always, always get me here in Long Beach and there's nothing really can do about those. So fight them. Yeah. <laughs> but it really does. Like, they're in really good. Early. It's those damn butterflies. Yes, man. You like you're like no, but I want the butterfly garden. You're like, but no, they're gonna come eat everything. Caterpillars come with it. So this is our last page. This is um, just some resources. Um, just keep in mind if you're ever looking at some studies and you're like, oh, I'm not sure about this study. Keep these um, research considerations in mind. 
look about, look at their sample size. And that just means like how many, um, you know, how many, like if it's people you're questioning, it's like how many, how much is your sample size? The bigger your sample size usually is the better data you will get, right? Because think of it this way. If you're asking like three people compared to a hundred people, it's more data, you'll get more information. Um, look at, look at the author and the publisher and their bias, like where they come from, their background, their education, if they're any kind of, you know, feeling any kind of weird stigma <laughs> anywhere in there. Um, that could, um, that's actually what brought me into cannabis was looking at crazy studies that contradicted their findings. Um, confounding factors are just like factors that really don't have to do with the, with the study. So they're obsolete. Um, uh, repeated studies, so um, look for similar studies. Um, that's more, almost like a peer review. Um, that helps, that study. And that's what the professional an an analysis is. So if anybody does reviews on that study. So then if you look at studies that way, um, you can see if they're credible or not. And these are just our go-to resource websites that we look up for pretty much everything from compliance to history to science, pretty much everything. And that's it. That is our personal um, regulations for California and Long Beach. So now you know what you can grow and what you can carry and um, how much you can purchase at one time. Definitely. Know your rights, do your research. Um, don't, you know, the cops are going to try to get out all the information they can from you and set you up, you know. That is right. Know your rights. Definitely. Um, yeah, it's, it's better if you know the facts. I always say that, right? Mm -hmm. like, even, if it, even if you see a smell, if there's nothing in, in sight, honestly, you could fight that. Exactly. It's all about, in, in, like, having this information gives you confidence, too. If that ever happens, you get pulled over, or if you're in, you find yourself in that situation. Mm -hmm. all right guys thank you so much thank you jessica thank you thanks. jess thanks for coming in all right guys happy Later. friday Bye.